Now the Egyptians have an account like this. When in the beginning the universe came into being, men first came into existence in Egypt. Both because of the favorable climate of the land and because of the nature of the Nile. For this stream, since it produces much life and provides a spontaneous supply of food, easily supports whatever living things may have been engendered. For both the root of the reed and the lotus, as well as the Egyptian bean and corsion, as it is called, and many other similar plants, supply the race of men with nourishment already for use. As proof that animal life appeared first of all in their land, they would offer the fact that even at the present day the soil of the Thebald at certain times generates mice in such numbers and of such size as to astonish all who have witnessed the phenomenon. For some of them are fully formed as far as the breast and front feet, and are able to move while the rest of the body is unformed, the clod of earth still retaining its natural character. And from this fact it is manifest that, when the world was first taking shape, the land of Egypt could better than any other have been the place where mankind came into being because of the well-tempered nature of its soil. For even at the present time, while the soil of no other country generates any such things, in it alone certain living creatures may be seen coming into being in a marvelous fashion." In general, he says, that if in the flood, which occurred in the time of Deucalion, most living things were destroyed, it is probable that the inhabitants of southern Egypt survived rather than any others, since their country is rainless, for the most part. Or if, as some maintain, the destruction of living things was complete, and the earth then brought forth again new forms of animals. Nevertheless, even on such a supposition, the first genesis of living things fittingly attaches to this country. For when the moisture from the abundant rains which fell among the peoples was mingled with the intense heat which prevails in Egypt itself, it is reasonable to suppose that the air became very well tempered for the first generation of all living things. Indeed, even in our day, during the inundations of Egypt, the generation of forms of animals of life can clearly be seen taking place in the pools which remain the longest. For, whenever the river has begun to recede, and the sun has thoroughly dried the surface of the slime, living animals, he says, take shape, some of them fully formed, but some only half so, and still actually united with the very earth." Now the men of Egypt, he says, when ages ago they came into existence, as they looked up at the firmament and were struck with both awe and wonder at the nature of the universe, conceived that two gods were both eternal and first, namely the sun and the moon, whom they called respectively Osiris and Isis. These appellations, having in each case been based upon a certain meaning in them, for when the names are translated into Greek, Osiris means many-eyed, and properly so, for in shedding his rays in every direction, he surveys with many eyes, as it were, all land and sea. And the words of the poet are also in agreement with this conception when he says, The sun who sees all things and hears all things. And of the ancient Greek writers of mythology, some give to Osiris the name Dionysus, or, with a slight change in form, Sirius. One of them, Eumolpus, in his Bacchic hymn, speaks of our Dionysus shining like a star, with fiery eyed in every ray, while Orpheus says, and this is why men call him Shining One, and Dionysus. Some say that Osiris is also represented with the cloak of fawn skin about his shoulders, as imitating the sky spangled with the stars. As for Isis, when translated, the word means ancient, the name having been given her because her birth was from everlasting and ancient. And they put horns on her head, both because of the appearance which she has to the eye when the moon is crescent-shaped, and because among the Egyptians a cow is held sacred to her. These two gods, they hold, regulate the entire universe, giving both nourishment and increase to all things by means of a system of three seasons which complete the full cycle through an unobservable movement, these being spring and summer and winter. 
And these seasons, though in nature most opposed to one another, complete the cycle of the year in the fullest harmony. Moreover, practically all the physical matter which is essential to the generation of all things is furnished by these gods. The sun contributing the fiery element and the spirit, the moon the wet and the dry, and both together the air. And it is through these elements that all things are engendered and nourished. And so it is out of the sun and moon that the whole physical body of the universe is made complete. And as for five parts just named of these bodies, the spirit, the fire, the dry, as well as the wet, and lastly, the air-like. Just as in the case of a man, we enumerate head and hands and feet and other parts, so in the same way the body of the universe is composed in its entirety of these parts. Each of these parts they regard as a god. And to each of them, the first men of Egypt, to use articulate speech, gave a distinct name appropriate to its nature. Now the spirit, they called, as we translate their expression, Zeus. And since he was the source of the spirit of life in animals, they considered him to be in a sense the father of all things. And they say that the most renowned of the Greek poets also agrees with this when he speaks of this god as the father of men and of gods. The fire they called Hephaestus, as it is translated, holding him to be a great god and one who contributes much both to the birth and full development of all things. The earth, again, they looked upon as a kind of vessel which holds all growing things and so gave it the name Mother. And in like manner, the Greeks also call it Demeter the word having been slightly changed in the course of time, for in olden times they called her Gay Meter, Earth Mother, to which Orpheus bears witness when he speaks of Earth, the mother of all, Demeter, giver of wealth. And the wet, according to them, was called by the men of old Ocean, which, when translated, means fostering mother, though some of the Greeks have taken it to be Oceanus, in connection with whom the poet also speaks of. Oceanus, source of gods, and mother Tethys. For the Egyptians consider Oceanus to be their river Nile, on which also their gods were born, since they say Egypt is the only country in the whole inhabited world where there are many cities which were founded by the first gods, such as Zeus, Helios, Hermes, Apollo, Pan, Elythia, and many more. The air, they say, they call Athena, as the name is translated, and they considered her to be the daughter of Zeus, and conceived of her as a virgin, because of fact the air is by its nature uncorrupted, and occupies the highest part of the entire universe. For the latter reason also the myth arose that she was born from the head of Zeus. Another name given her was Tritogenia, thrice born, because her nature changes three times in the course of the year, in the spring, summer, and winter. They add that she is also called Glycopis, blue-eyed, not because she has blue eyes, as some Greeks have held, a silly explanation indeed, but because the air has a bluish cast. These five deities, they say, visit all the inhabited world, revealing themselves to men in the form of sacred animals, and at times even appearing in the guise of men or in other shapes. Nor is this a fabulous thing, but possible if these are in very truth the gods who give life to all things, and also the poet who visited Egypt and became acquainted with such accounts as these from the lips of the priests, in some place in the writing sets forth an actual fact, which has been said, the gods in strangers form from alien lands frequent the cities of men in every guise, observing their insolence and lawful ways. Now so far as the celestial gods are concerned, whose genesis is from eternity, this is the account given by the Egyptians. And besides these, there are other gods, they say, who were terrestrial, having once been mortals, but who, by reason of their sagacity and the good services which they rendered to all men, attained immortality, some of them having even been kings of Egypt. Their names, when translated, are in some cases the same as those of the celestial gods, while others have a distinct appellation, such as Helios, Cronus, and Rhea, and also the Zeus, who is called Ammon by some, and besides these Hera and Hephaestus, also Hestia, and finally Hermes. Helios was the first king of the Egyptians, his name being the same as that of the heavenly star, 
Some of the priests, however, say that Hephaestus was their first king, since he was the discoverer of fire, and received the rule because of this service to mankind. For once, when a tree on the mountains had been struck by lightning, and the forest nearby was ablaze, Hephaestus went up to it, for it was winter time, and greatly enjoyed the heat. As the fire died down, he kept adding fuel to it, and while keeping the fire going in this way, he invited the rest of mankind to enjoy the advantage which came from it. Then Cronus became the ruler, and upon marrying his sister Rhea, he begot Osiris and Isis, according to some writers of mythology, but according to the majority, Zeus and Hera, whose high achievements gave them dominion over the entire universe. From these last were sprung five gods, one born on each of the five days, which the Egyptians intercalate. The names of these children were Osiris and Isis, and also Typhon, Apollo, and Aphrodite. And Osiris, when translated, is Dionysus. And Isis is more similar to Demeter than to any other goddess. And after Osiris married Isis and succeeded in the kingship, he did many things of service to the social life of man.